All right, so um, I'll get back to my normal critical mode soon enough, but uh, I'd like to take a moment to celebrate where we actually are now. A long time ago, before DK2, before Gear VR, before the first Oculus Connect, I remember being at an event and talking about my vision for virtual reality, what I wanted to see. And I laid out this vision of I want a self-contained headset that has cameras for tracking, that can run lightweight content locally, but you can still plug into a PC to run really high-powered content. And you know that was the fantasy six years ago, but it's exactly where we are with Quest today. And for the people that have been along for so much of this journey, it's easy to forget that most of the world has still never even seen VR, and we have such magical things to show them now. So interestingly, there was a lot of internal kind of trepidation about the products that we released this year with Quest and Rift S. You know, there were thoughts that Quest is too heavy, too uncomfortable, too underpowered, or too expensive, and that Rift S was kind of a step sideways, or maybe even a little back with the 80 hertz LCD screen and the problematic tracking poses. But this gave us some really valuable uh, insights to be able to do almost direct A-B tests. And it turns out that Rift S is substantially more retentive than the earlier Rift, even with the exact same content. And this was like the experiment that we did with Gear VR to Go. It wasn't nearly as dramatic as Go's more than 2x increase in retention, but it was still a very meaningful point that the friction to get into and uh, play the experiences is such a dominant force for virtual reality where the fact that you know, people that are used to it that set up their cameras and deal with all the, the little issues and USB problems, I, you know, maybe it's not a big deal for a lot of people, but statistically, it sure seems that inside-out tracking was really the right thing to do for us. And as we look at it right now, sure, Go is still a better place to watch videos, and Rift S is still a better place to play Rift content. But you can see where this is going in the future, where future generations of hardware should be able to do all the things better than any of the other things before. And there's also quite a bit of headroom for us where we say we still have all these friction points with Quest and there's still all the quality and things that we can do to improve it. So we can expect future headsets to kind of continue to take those ratcheting steps up as a more and more retentive platform. And so I think uh, another thing that the Rift F showed me personally is that I was undervaluing the Rift gaming content, where when Go came out and we were seeing retention numbers almost as good as Rift uh, from Go, I was thinking, well, you know, we've got a clear path here with a very inexpensive headset that we can get to mass market uh, and hopefully mass adoption faster. Uh, and it seems to be doing pretty much as well as Rift. But with Rift S kind of showing that there is a lot more headroom there. I think we can say that the PC experience uh, was holding down what the value of the content was, and we get a little bit better with Rift S, and then a lot better for that style of content with Quest. So Quest is, you know, by far now, our most retentive hardware. It's doing extremely well for that, and, uh, you know, and that's pretty exciting. So uh, remote rendering is an obvious thing to do. Again, I was preaching this six years ago, where it was clear that you've got things that work really well on a local headset, but there's always something that you want more power for. A typical gaming PC is maybe 40 times as powerful as the system on a chip that we've got inside the standalones, and you can always go up from there. Some of the Facebook Reality Labs demos that they do actually run with multiple Titan GPUs stuffed into one box. You know, there's always something that you can do with more power. But it's also worth pointing out that we have some amazing experiences on Quest, on this tiny, underpowered system. I mean, you can still play some spectacular things. And that might be pointing to the fact that maybe we really were too aggressive with the minimum spec machine on PCs. You could argue that, well, if we could do these things on a little Snapdragon chipset, you probably could have run great Rift content on laptops and relatively underpowered PCs without a really high-end GPU in it. Now, the developers have had to work harder and suffer a lot more to hit, uh, you know, to hit frame rates on Quest than they have to on Rift. That is, you know, one of the advantages of the PC, even if you're not doing spectacular graphics, sometimes it's the right thing just to make life that much easier for you. But still, there's clearly value in having the option of throwing more power at things. Now, people had been doing demos of remote rendering since all the way back in Gear VR. You know, there were some early demos that had even cloud rendering for VR uh, streamed to a Gear VR. But internally, we have, you know, we have a lot of perfectionists at Oculus, and 
I often have arguments about value where you can look at something and say, oh, this is terrible and for X, Y, and Z reason, but if people find value in it, I tend to be of the position that let people choose to do things even if other people don't think they're of a sufficiently high quality level. But we have a lot of debates about minimum bars of quality and poisoning the well and kind of discussions like that. And while I had been pitching we should be doing remote rendering on Quest pretty early on, there was the general consensus internally that we needed dedicated hardware for it, that uh, you know, either you needed 60 gigahertz Wi-Fi or you needed a uh, display port over USB or something to let us do something special directly and solve it with hardware. But I had held the opinion that we could do a quite good job on the existing hardware that we had without necessarily buying anything else. And the, the basic ideas is just, you, know, you render something on the, you sense the controllers on the Quest, you send that information over to the PC where it does the normal rendering, uh, and composites it together, video compresses it, and then sends it over a link. So everybody knows that Wi-Fi has pretty wide variability in quality and performance. You might only have a millisecond or two of latency, but it is not at all uncommon to see delays of one or 200 milliseconds, which would be really disruptive to VR experiences. So we decided that the first step that we would take would be doing this directly cabled experience. With, uh, with the USB cable, there's uh, essentially no error rate and no significant latency, uh, no significant jitter. You know, it's just a matter of a couple milliseconds based on when drivers wake up and do things. And it was more than ample bandwidth. We're actually limited on the video decoder to around 150 megabits per second, which is just coasting on a, a USB 3. It should even kind of operate on USB 2 level bandwidth. But this is sort of the first step. I mean, this is sort of some of us getting our foot in the door. It's like, all right, we're shipping a remote rendering experience, but clearly we would like this to work on Wi-Fi eventually. And then even though we will probably never really endorse it, hey, if it works on Wi-Fi, you can stream from even a remote computer over the cloud. But that is, you know, we do not have line of sight on making that a great experience for like a really remote distant computer. Uh, there are architectures that you can imagine where you change the way games are rendered. So like you render your hands locally and uh, you stream only the things that aren't changing much. But it, one of my real lessons from doing this for a number of years now is that getting developers to, uh, you know, to really change the way a game would be architected specifically to take advantage of something is really hard. I mean, hardly anybody takes advantage of my precious time warp layers that make all the text look so good. Uh, so I'm not super, uh, you know, super enthusiastic about doing split rendering architectures. But um, internally, so the difference between what a half dozen other people have done with the, uh, the remote rendering and what we can do because we have the, you know, we have the internal access to everything. We can have lots of custom stuff put in on the PC side, on the compositor. Uh, on the mobile side, we've been able to peel away at least one layer of the video, uh, kind of the overhead of working with the video codecs where the way it all stacks up, normally on Android, if you're writing a normal application, you write to kind of the media codecs, which then talks over to Stage Fright, which talks to Open and Open MXIL, which talks to the kernel, which eventually talks to the Qualcomm hardware, their little Venus uh, video processor. Uh, so we made some changes. We peeled away the top level, uh, the top couple things there. So our remote rendering talks directly to the Open Max driver. Uh, which helps a little bit and gives us some more control. But there's actually a lot more on the table there where if we can, if we can get Qualcomm to, uh, to open up or cooperate a little bit more at the lowest level, I really want to get down and write custom microcode on the, the Venus processor because if we can do that, then we can do some alternate architectures where instead of sending full frames buffered up over and dealing with them kind of like we do uh, with the reprojection normally, we could treat it essentially like a remote monitor. We could be compressing things one scan line at a time over the huge bandwidth over USB so that it's coming in just you know, 16 scan lines ahead of where it's going to be drawn on the Quest. And given that, we could actually beat Rift S in terms of motion to photons latency because Rift S uses an LCD, which is global shutter, so it has to scan the whole frame in, while Quest is an OLED with a rolling shutter, which means that we have the possibility of being uh, up to almost a frame less latency. So that's uh, a good chunk of different work that would need to be done there. It might not, we might even be able to do it without direct cooperation from Qualcomm if we wrote some custom uh, GPU or DSP encoding for it. 
But uh, instead, we did make the decision kind of do this in a more forward-looking way because we know that we want Wi-Fi support uh, and being able to do it over more variable conditions. So right now, it does pull the entire frame over and then reproject it with time warp just like it was a local app. So what this means is that uh, you know, attitude uh, moving around with your head is just as good as any local application. Uh, but if you're moving, like translating side to side, or especially with the controllers, you will notice a little bit more latency on it. It's, you know, it's a little bit worse than Rift S. And it also means that the quality is a little bit lower for two reasons, both because it is compressed, so it's sending it across, it's compressing it down to 150-ish megabits per second to send over the wire. And then, as always happens with the time warp stuff, it winds up resampling it one more time there, um, where we have possibility of going directly to the screen in some other ways that would be a little bit better. But still, I'm pretty proud of what we've done. I think it's significantly the best remote rendering experience relative to a half dozen other things that, uh, that people have tried for that. And so that's, I, you know, that's a good thing. Now, there was some internal debate about how the product user experience would be. Uh, you could imagine kind of a highly designed approach where your Rift apps just show up in your Quest library, and you launch them from there, and it just launches it on Rift, and it just kind of works like a Quest app that's running on higher-powered hardware. But the alternate direction is to do what we did, which is to basically treat it sort of like a Rift queue. It's basically treating the Quest as if it was just a Rift that was plugged into your PC. Because there's always going to be some things that you want to do on your, your kind of desktop using Dash rather than uh, using just the applications there. And it also gives us a, a pretty good clarity. But there's a chance that, over, that eventually we might shift things a little bit more towards running them directly. But for now, I think we've made the right call of it just turns your quest into a rift. It's not necessarily the, the best user experience I, you know, in some ways, but it gives you the most flexibility by far. Now, I, you know, as we move forward into the future with Quest, it is time for me to probably give a bit of a eulogy for Gear VR. I am, you know, it's, it's been announced that <laughs> You know, that it's not going to be available on the future Samsung phones. So while, you know, it's currently the software is fully supported, uh, the days are numbered. And I do think that we missed an opportunity here. Uh, you know, I invested a whole lot of effort into it. And it's, it's the foundation that we've built all the mobile things off of. But, you know, looking back, it's clear that we had huge unit volumes. I mean, I put in a request for Samsung to, for me to be able to actually say the number of, uh, you know, headsets and activations, and they declined. But it's a large number. It's much larger than all of our other headsets. Uh, and it had good reviews. People liked it, but it was not retentive. I mean, the retention, we have you know, Quest up here, Rift S, Rift, Go, and then Gear VR is way lower. So it was the kind of the classic leaky bucket that growth companies are advised not to pour, you know, pour effort into, where uh, we did pour a lot, of, a lot of money into the content there. There were significant amounts of money that was spent on content. And when I, when I would look at a spreadsheet of where all of it went and some of the apps that did almost nothing, uh, it was, you know, it's kind of sad to see that the money didn't really wind up getting much in the way of returns there. I, and, you know, sometimes I, I would complain that I felt I didn't have as much support internally, that everybody was much more excited about Rift and standalones and so on. But there's a clear lesson here with this stark contrast of how much retention that we have on the same content on Go. And this really speaks again to the importance of friction in getting into the experience, where I, you know, we had other theories like you know, early on, the overheats were a problem. But in retrospect, the people that were overheating their phones in VR were playing VR and were having a good time. And that wasn't really driving them away. Uh, there were concerns about, I, people draining their battery, you know, that's still an issue. People get anxious when they're, they're kind of draining their, their phone battery, which is their lifeline to the internet and everything. Uh, but far and away, I think the biggest issue was just the friction of getting into it. And I like to think that if you had, like if you could magically hold your phone up in front of your face and it just transformed into a VR headset, we'd have like 95% retention and it would be super amazing. But if you have to pop your phone out of its phone case and dock it into a Gear VR and put it on, you will use it twice. And we have lots of signal of people essentially doing that. I'm, 
Now, there's things that we could imagine doing to make it a better experience. You know, the docking was fiddly, the mounting was fiddly, there's all sorts of software things that, that we could have done a lot better. And, you know, in fact, I think Daydream's holder was a little bit better than the Gear VR holder because I, you know, it just, it just let the phone fit in. It didn't have any active electronics on there. They sacrificed not having a touchpad or not having an integrated IMU for being a little bit more drop-in and kind of stretchy strap uh, the thing around there. And we could have conceivably made a phone holder that if we knew the specific size of the phone, we could uh, protrude the eye cups a little bit so it would still work with a case. It'd be heavier there and worse ergonomic experience, but we could have at least made it work to kill out that, you know, that awful friction. Where, again, I, uh, if the lessons we learned from this is it's almost always better to trade things to make it easier and faster to get into the experience. Now, some of the other things that we had to compromise on as we supported broader and broader ranges of phones, the holder got you know, less and less optimal for any specific one. The very first Gear, uh, Gear VR with the Note 4, that slotted in nicer and it seemed to just generally feel a little bit better than the later universal holders that handled everything from the tiny little A-series phones up to the giant Note phones. And it also meant compromises where to let the tiny phones fit in there, we had to crop down the edges of the eye cups where the notes and gal uh, big galaxies could have had a wider field of view there and generally worked better. So, you know, maybe the, the phone holder friction really was just insurmountable, but there were a few other directions that we might have tried. You know, one path was that really early on, we had solid data showing that people playing games with joy pads were. Uh, you know, having a better time, much more retentive, much more time spent, and all of that. Uh, we knew that the, the little touchpad was just not a great gaming interface, although it's interesting now on the later systems, sometimes if you just want to watch Netflix, you kind of regret not having the little touchpad there and having to fumble for a controller at some point. But clearly it wasn't good for long-form entertainment experiences. So we had, uh, we talked a lot about just make a gamepad, the default controller there, because not only would that let you do good VR games, it would give us the possibility of leaning into traditional Android gaming in various ways. Uh, if you just said this was Android on a big screen for a lot of things and you could play Fortnite in your giant VR room, that would have some significant value. Now we actually got fairly far along with this to the point of having some prototypes built and they were, uh, neat, like another company had done this, but they slot in kind of in the front where the phone goes, so it's kind of a combination lens protector uh, for the, as well as the actual joypad holder. But the problem was we had designed a simplified uh, gamepad controller because internally there was this thought that full-on gamepads were too complicated for, you know, for the broad consumer base. And I'm pretty sure I can track some of this to an early story where Brendan was raising funds early on in Oculus and he was talking to some older investor venture capitalist demoing DK1 stuff and hands him a game controller and it was clear the old guy had never held uh, like an Xbox controller in his life. And I think that scarred Brendan and influenced our strategy for a while there. Uh, but the nail in the coffin was it couldn't play Minecraft. You know, it didn't have enough buttons to play Minecraft, so what was the point of doing the, that controller? And we wound up doing the, you know, the pointer controller, which you know, works out reasonably well for VR and uh, was a reasonable path towards eventually having the six degree of freedom controllers. But that was you know, one of the paths not taken. And the other major one would have been actually nailing all the immersive video or immersive media in general right. The whole 360 photos, 180 VR, 360 VR, all of this, there's enough value there and I, it frustrates me because we just have not stirred that pot correctly. I mean, why don't we have the Instagram of immersive media? We have so much stuff that people are amazed when they see it or when they see it running in the quality that it should be in uh, and it just seems like we've had stuff sitting on the table that we just haven't really picked up. And there's, you know, like the cameras have made amazing strides. I feel guilty about this where the cameras have gone from the very first Ricoh Theta to you know, the push button 5K uh, 60 frames per second cameras that are available now. Just massive progress there where we've done very little on the content uh, production, presentation, distribution, sharing side of things for that. Uh, and we still have to solve all of that for our big headsets. So, I mean, despite whether gaming and entertainment, whatever is the majority application, immersive media is absolutely one of the top three applications. And we had one prototype headset that 
you know, might have been a, uh, you know, significant for this, where we had one headset built with these custom super wide angle lenses that could use the full width of one of the Note or Galaxy phones, and watching you know, Henry or Dear Angelica or some of the Felix and Paul things, the very well produced uh, media, it was really pretty amazing with that. And it would have been a little bit more expensive, but that's another one of the data points that we've learned uh, as we've done some of these product experiments where at some point when we're in tens of millions of users, all the very low price points are really gonna matter. But as we've seen now, Gear VR went from 99 to 129 with the controller, and it really didn't do much of anything to any of the curves for adoption. So, and the last kind of direction that got talked about a lot in the, the kind of waning days of this was doing some kind of a more sophisticated plug-in headset. The idea being that, okay, docking the phone is a complete pain. It's the huge friction point, especially if you've got a case. You know, what if you just kind of wired it down to your phone? And that has, you know, like on the one hand, you say, well, you could just plug a Rift S into a phone, write all the right software and drive it there. But that, it doesn't feel right to me. I mean, there's, people have different opinions on this, but at that point, you're back to the very earliest days of Gear VR with something that just barely works, overheats all the time, drains the battery down a whole lot. I was actually more excited about the possibility of doing an ultra lightweight, super comfortable headset, really lean in on something that you felt like you could wear for hours on end and just had a better screen. If you just had a better screen and it was, you know, kind of like a super go plugged into your phone. I thought that could still be, uh, you know, be useful. So, um, you know, as it is the runtime VR shell, all of our first party apps, I mean, all of these have carried through to Go and Quest and are the foundation that we're building a lot of things on. And I am super happy now that with the Go compatibility layer, we have the ability to start running some of the old content on uh, Quest now. Now we made a really, uh, kind of timid first step with this. There's just some of the, the top 50 apps that have gone through QA uh, that are being released now. Uh, because there are a lot of things that can be worried, you have to worry about. Mapping the inputs is the primary one, but how well it, uh, it handles six degree of freedom headset and controller motion. And some apps were written in such a way that it was written before Quest existed at all, but you start it up and because they use the APIs in sort of the forward compatible way, they magically have six degree of freedom headset tracking and the Go controller moves around in six degree of freedom when you're running in emulation mode but a lot of apps have a lot of problems, like the floor height is done wrong, so your, uh, your controller is down by your feet, uh, or there's various things that are clipped off at the edges, and there's some other internal reasons why that's a little bit problematic. But, um, but this is, you know, I do very much want it to eventually open up to the entire catalog, because I do care about kind of preservation and archiving, and, you know, I would like us to be more like Microsoft than Apple in this regard, where you know, every program I ever wrote for iOS is, is lost to the ages now since Apple disabled 32-bit support. Uh, I don't want that to happen to the earliest VR apps. I want it to be possible to have a, a retro VR scene 20 years from now of you know, people going and trying the, the first consumer mobile VR apps. So I'm... Yeah. So I do get a bit sad kind of thinking about the twilight of a product line, but, but then I go play some Beat Saber and I feel better about VR today. <laughs> and so you know, VR in my mind is supposed to be all about being this universal platform. It should be doing everything. And I, I get really irritated in our internal strategy sessions when we're like gaming focused or talking about separate, you know, separate media or enterprise SKUs and different things. But, you know, but gaming is our focus now and it's where we've got uh, kind of some real traction to be working on. So I'll start with that application area. And one of the, one of the things that's really become clear playing, playing a whole lot on Quest now is that the, the notion of immersion in VR is somewhat at odds with a lot of the really uh, kind of frantic, intense things that you wind up doing, where the, the sixed off tracked controllers give you sort of a physicality and, and intensity that no other video game gives you, but you're really not that, uh, you know, super immersed, it's, a, it's more of a lizard brain immersion level. I mean, when you're going through just totally in the moment, focused on everything, and you've just done something amazing that you can't even, your brain hasn't even caught up with it, it's like you feel like you're channeling John Wick dodging around things. And I, 
But then you're kind of like, okay, it's all, uh, you're doing all that, but you're not in the wonder of the experience. You're like under the gun, sweating and stressing about all of this. While the other side of things is when I was playing the first Vader Immortal, and I kind of walked out onto that ledge, you know, overlooking the lava fields of Mustafar, and, and I just literally sat down cross-legged on my floor and soaked in the experience for a while. You know, this is a a really amazing thing. This is sort of the magic that people imagined on VR. You know, when people were, you know, were thinking about VR in the 90s, that's more what they were thinking about, you know, not so much Beat Saber or Super Hot, whatever. But there's clearly value in both of these. And I think developers should think about how to kind of bridge between them in some ways, where uh, it's actually kind of nice in Super Hot, you get done, you finally clear some, uh, some world and all the stress drains away a little bit, you're back in the little computer room and you're just kind of peering around looking at things and figuring out the pacing for that where you have this challenge in all game designs, but I think it's a little bit more so in VR when you can really have people tuned up kind of to a higher level than you really do anywhere else. Now, another thing that was a little bit of a surprise for us is Quest started off saying internally it was like all going to be about room scale. Like there was a period when we were saying every funded experience was a room scale experience because that was going to be the differentiating thing that made Quest different than anything else that, that people would have. But it quickly uh, dawned on us as we were going through all of this that one, not only did most people in the world, most potential customers, really not have a room to be able to devote to VR. Uh, and if you say it's like, well, you're going to move things for VR, that puts popping your phone out of the phone holder to shame in terms of how much friction you're going to add to the experience. So we really did, uh, you know, we had to kind of back off from that and find out that most of the best experiences uh, really are things that require only modest movement. Uh, and I was, you know, I was happy to hear like super hot uh, devs did a blog going about some kind of the same journey of building out big things and finding out it really worked out better, kind of keeping it a little closer and tighter together. Now, walking around in the big spaces is absolutely amazing. It is some of the you know, the, the richest stuff that you can do in VR. And like when I was playing uh, Red Matter, uh, which has all this great glorious stuff to look at, we have, yeah, we have a big room uh, for demoing at Oculus that, uh, in Dallas, and I traced out the whole wide guardian there, and I wanted to just walk around in here, but even with a larger area than any normal person would have available, it was really limited where I'd walk a little bit and I'd still have to turn and recenter and going back. And if I was in a stadium sized area, it would have just been absolutely amazing. But it, you know, I think that is the lesson that walking around, unless you've just got something that's happening just within a few feet, uh, it turns out not to be a great game design part and it may push a lot of people away. And in general, uh, on graphics design, the advice I've been giving forever on mobile stuff about don't try to push too hard on the graphics. Again, Red Matter is sort of an exception that, uh, that proves the rule a bit where they pushed really hard on the graphics. I uh, add similarly with like Daedalus on Gear VR before or on Go before. Um, but in general, I see for every you know, Red Matter doing great jobs with all the shaders and keeping the frame, matter, frame rate up, I see 100 applications that are missing frame rate when they shouldn't be and would be better off by sticking with something a little bit more stylized and simpler approach. And also, I do wish people would turn down the use of fixed foveated rendering. Far too many games just have that cranked up to the maximum. It's like, more is going to be better. And then you wind up with the, the really ugly bits of anything resembling text that slides into a, a foveated region. Uh, it just then looks really, really bad. Uh, do remember, you can change that zero cost every frame. So you can go ahead, when you pull up your UI, turn it off completely so it looks good. Uh, the other things, again, speaking to the, the huge success of Beat Saber, music and audio is one of the very best things you can do in VR because we have to make these struggles about graphics, the trade-offs, you know, your quality versus your frame rate, but you could just do music perfectly, and you should. This is one of the very best things you can do. Similarly, voice acting is very inexpensive quality to put onto your game. I mean, yes, you have to worry about localization, but in many cases, even foreign voice acting with subtitles is going to add a level of polish to the experience that I, you know, that just miming things around really doesn't. And similarly with positional audio, a couple things that I think people are still underusing is 
Animation is literally free from a performance standpoint, and seeing things happening very close in front of you, especially with 6 off tracking, that sense of a private performance of something happening right in front of you is extremely high value for things. Uh, adding character to the, the things that are in your world, uh, actually demonstrating and performing things and letting it happen as you move around, this is underutilized in VR today. And similarly, haptics is fairly new for a lot of the developers. Uh, adding just even a little thing. I try to point out in the app reviews that anytime you have some, some explosion effect or something happening visually, you should always have it tied with strong audio, and you should also tie it with some form of haptics. I mean, blend the three senses together, and don't be subtle about it. There are you know, there's, you can think about, like, you're closing your eyes, thinking about the haptics, feeling, you know, exactly how it's doing, but people aren't doing that. You need to be just kind of smacking them in the hands uh, with the haptics when you want something to be appreciated. And there's, uh, you know, all the normal kind of gaming things, load times, cloud saves. I mean, I have literally abandoned some games that have excessively long load times. Uh, it does matter. I mean, everybody can point to things like Fortnite that takes a minute and a half to load on mobile and say it's the most popular game in the world or whatever, but that's not how you build an audience. I mean, once you've got a large audience, you can start imposing on them more for, uh, for various reasons, but when you're trying to get people to get over the hump to be attached to your game, it's really important to make it quick and easy to get into the game. Similarly with things that are long intro roles, I am, you know, one of the games that I was reviewing in the app reviews looked really good, but it had all of these kind of slow roll up to things. I'm like, I'm skipping, and they're like, no, don't skip. We have neat stuff to, to show here. It's like if it's not happening, you know, really immediately, faster than you think it needs to. Uh, similarly with a lot of the immersive videos, like, you know, I love the Felix and Paul uh, Cirque du Soleil videos, but they take like, a minute to get into the actual good stuff going on because they want to have their, their credit rolls and I uh, kind of cool logo treatments and everything. But no, you just want to drop users into the fun stuff immediately. Seconds matter on all that. And I do think that there's, uh, there's revenue left on the table for a lot of developers thinking about you should figure out ways to have more things to sell people. I mean, you in VR, you're hopefully making a powerful impression on people. If you've done something good, have something else that they can buy to support you. If they had a great time, they're probably happy to. Uh, you know, if Beat Saber had 10 music packs on Quest, I would own all of them. And you get this to the extreme case of uh, mobile games, free-to-play games are known for being supported by the whales. Uh, you know, like, I'm a whale on Comixology. I have like 9,000 comic books that I've bought there <laughs> that's... I, you want to be able to find, get something like that going in VR, where whether you split it up and you've got five add-ons, different things you can do there, and try to have them ready, like, initially, like, when people first play the game. If you have it coming soon, you'll already have lost some of the people by, you know, by the time you release them. Now, the, the question of curation for our game development is a, a hot topic internally, again, where the argument for it is that you want people to be able to go to the store and understand that everything in here is going to be quality, that nobody's going to buy something that they regret buying or have to file a refund that leaves a bad taste in their mouth. I, I, I expect this will, you know, that this will be softened a little bit. I am, you know, I do favor more the Wild West side of things, but there's good arguments for this, you know, either way where People can say, you know, Nintendo for so long was very successful with a very curated experience. I am, but, you know, we do have sort of a backdoor with the Go compatibility stuff now where once we do finally get uh, kind of everything up there, you can sort of write a quest game as a Go and make dynamic decisions about things, but you'll have no exposure in the store, no exposure through uh, any of the uh, kind of explore things going on, but you can still take advantage of quest features uh, dynamically as a Go application. Now in the uh, kind of non-VR content is another thing that historically, you know, I've, I've always been waving this flag of there's a trillion dollars worth of content that was built for other screens. And I just think it's completely unreasonable to pretend that people are going to recreate all of the value in that content in VR-specific applications. And it should be the universal platform. You should be able to do everything in VR, ideally just configuring your workspace however you want and sourcing content from everywhere. And there will be a point where the idea of the VR headset, it should be the best screen in the house, that 
you know, whatever other tablets, phones, uh, screen, TVs that you use, you should be able to have the VR version that is better in some significant way. It'll be a while before we're hitting 4K TV levels, but in terms of convenience and a lot of things that you can do with it, it should be there. Now, you know, we have, we've come some distance. We have a limited selection of the Android apps in our uh, Oculus TV application. Um, you know, we have the streaming trifecta now with Netflix, YouTube, Amazon Prime, so I'm really happy we've got that. And then I'm very excited now that we've got Fandango now for movies, including all the 3D movies. We're, we're going to have almost every 3D movie ever made eventually available here. And it's not there yet, but we will finally have downloaded movies back, which is something that uh, was a horrible regression from my point of view, where before the VR shell days, we had downloading in our Oculus video app for movies, and we lost it and we never got it back. So finally, that's going to be coming back, which is nice. And uh, you know, a little tip with the Fandango now, you can use Movies Anywhere to link your iTunes account. So you know, for me, I've got a library of movies on iTunes. I was able to now, for the first time ever, watch them in VR, like I've wanted for years years. I'm very happy about that. Now, I am dedicated 2D game streaming. You know, people talking about Stadia and things like that. I, I've for years thought that there is absolutely a future in game streaming. Now, Oculus was founded by some people coming out of Gaikai and other companies that had, you know, felt burned by it, more negative, uh, negative view of it. But I do think, like the Netflix uh, kind of transition, at some point it's almost inevitable. Uh, and I think that VR will be an excellent client for it, where in many cases, you know, I make the point that most TVs that aren't put into game mode add more latency than the internet would to your gameplay experience. So people, you know, in VR, we control the display, we control all of that. It should be an excellent top-of-the-line client for any kind of game streaming, and there is enormous amounts of value there. So I'm excited about eventually getting some of that. We don't have anything close enough to in the works, but those are our small, tightly focused projects that can deliver you know, a great deal of value. And then for everything else in the world, the browser is the backstop. You know, as uh, a web experience for when you don't have the app for something, it's not available. And I'm, I'm super proud of our browser team for, you know, it's a small team and they've done a great job of having a very high performance browser that stayed up to date with, uh, you know, the, the Chrome compatibility for things. And we are, uh, like we have general purpose DRM almost sorted out for the browser experience. So even the, you know, the high end media companies that, uh, that still have web DRM, that should be coming to the VR browsers relatively soon. I still wish that we had some little tiny extra extensions to the web experience so that companies could easily do things like change the 3D environment or a 360 photo behind the web screen and do some kind of basic control of the VR environment so it's not just a floating web screen, but you can add a little bit more to it. I am, but that's, uh, that kind of ties in with the fixing immersive media where I've, I've shown these lighthouse experiences like Henry and some of the other work that I've done where it can look so much better than people are used to seeing. And just this, uh, like this last week or so, I've been working with Next to VR on doing some specialized players for some of their content. And everybody is just really amazed at how good this can look, even at bit rate that's, uh, that's amenable for streaming. And another thing on that side where everybody comes down to these very conservative numbers like 10, 15 megabits something, Looking at the stats for our, uh, our user base on, the, like, on Quest, half the people have 40 plus megabits and like a quarter of the people have 80 plus megabits streaming to our headsets. And that's with a very conservative estimate where you do multiple simultaneous streams and it can go up much higher than that. So there's possibility of streaming you know, exquisitely high quality content to our existing headsets. Uh, you know, we are not right now close to even saturating our displays in most cases. So there's a lot more that can be done there. Now, there are so many applications that are sort of thin wrappers around a little bit of immersive media, and that does seem fairly wasteful because none of them do the things right, almost none of them do things right in terms of getting it on layers and getting the sRGB sampling and all the picky little things there. And it does feel like we want to move towards a world where more of that is done in the web, where the web browser experience is better UI than practically every uh, third-party application. It is on a layer with sRGB filtering at the right pixel scale, and if you make a web UI, it's just gonna look better than whatever you cobble together in Unity. 
Uh, but right now, the options for playing the immersive video is just not so great on the web. There's the web VR players that people kind of use as a standard really do none of the things right uh, in terms of all of the high quality things. So they work, but it's, it's not the quality experience that I want to put forward. So I want us to do more of that natively in our browser. Uh, but I've been told by a number of people that the web standards communities get really defensive and up in arms at adding sort of web tag extensions by specific vendors. And if we just go make Oculus specific extensions, here, play this immersive video, automatically switch to the right projection, do everything right, and it's a magic Oculus tag that they will be mad at us and we might even be shunned from future standards body stuff and we have to just go through this long, slow standardization process. Uh, and not a lot of progress has been made on that. So that's been frustrating for me because I'm sort of the, just go make it happen, get her done and, uh, and we'll sort it out later. So on the social side, it's, you know, looking back, it's kind of embarrassing at all the stages that we've gone through this at Oculus. Like, way back in the early days, uh, I did the social APK on Gear VR so you could co-watch Twitch and uh, some of the movies and things. And then we had spaces on Rift and rooms uh, on Gear and Go uh, and venues and co-watching. And now we have Facebook Horizon. And our avatars have continuously mutated from the little floating heads through you know, three different versions of things, and we have the codec avatars on the horizon, and we just we do not have this well sorted out at this point. I am, and by the way, I, I am uh, really sad about the fact that we are going to wind up deprecating rooms. I, you know, the servers will eventually get, uh, get shut off, I, I think, at the end of this year, which I do think is a shame, because rooms can run like on Quest with the Gear, Gear VR or the Go emulation, uh, a number of people find some value in it, but it's not showing any significant growth. It's trailing down, and they want to focus efforts on the kind of the, the larger bets for things. But other things that are social in terms of kind of breaking the isolation of VR, and I'm still you know, the champion of the power of isolation. I like isolation for a lot of things, but uh, it's, you know, it's kind of the antithesis of the Facebook message of bringing people together. So we keep firing these social bullets at things to, uh, to try to get a hit. But uh, some of the kind of outside VR things, the asynchronous social aspect, and it's kind of, it's worth noting that uh, the very first time I met Mark Zuckerberg, I, we were talking about kind of synchronous gaming and play, and he was very much touting the power of asynchronous social things, which is what Facebook is. And having uh, some of the things, the most powerful social thing by far for me that we've done is notifications of Beat Saber scores. You know, waking up, it's like, Sean Liu beat your score in Beat Saber. Oh, yeah, we'll see about that. I am, you know, that's been like, that's the notification that I like to see, you know, and it does do exactly what it's supposed to do. It makes you want to go grab the headset, get back into the game, and, and play. It's, it's pure win there. Then we have, uh, you know, we've made a lot of progress on casting. And in fact, uh, I ran into some people that were, were still thinking the way casting was a year ago, barely working in various ways. There have been a couple rounds of improvements for things. We have, uh, you know, we've improved the quality in a few different ways, but we still have a lot more that we can do here. Like during my app reviews, we randomly lose casting uh, a couple times during that. It has some kinds of reliability problems. There's still more latency and more quality loss than we'd like to have. Uh, there's other options like Miracast that we're looking at, the possibility of uh, streaming to arbitrary web browsers. Somebody mentioned they'd love to be able to cast over a plugged in USB cable when they're in sort of convention Wi-Fi death zones for things. And those are all good, uh, you know, good ideas. And we've got this, we need to, combine, kind of converge all the different things that we do with video, where we have live streaming to Facebook, we have our different casting approaches, and we have recording to files, and you'd like to have just an advanced options page that lets you turn, change frame rate, resolution, bit rate, all those different things in a uniform way around all of it, because there's, you know, there's a bunch of value to have there. And then, uh, back to sort of the, the Gear VR days of, uh, I loved one reviewer that said the most fun thing to do with VR is to show other people VR. And we've, you know, we had, we still are not at the perfect spot with that, where in many ways Gear VR was sort of the best thing. It was before we had a recentered dialogue for it on Go or Guardian on Quest. And we need to work out how to get back to that so that you can just hand the headset to someone, they put it on and nothing pops up, nothing gets in the way of their experience and they're just dropped in exactly where you want them to be. 
You know, we have some other neat effects now, like the, uh, the ability to, from the companion app, launch applications for them. It's like, hey, look at this. And kind of going back to what I was saying about load times, imagine those sessions when you're working on your title. You've made something cool, you want people to show it, but say somebody's in a room showing all of their friends VR, and they say, hey, I'm launching this awesome game. And then you have to sit there and make small talk while they're sitting there you know, for a minute sometimes to get the game loaded into where it's actually new and interesting. Um, we have some neat new features with deep linking that can send people to specific places in the games. So we can do this from, uh, from our Explorer feed or from various web links, which is another nice thing that kind of gets you into things faster. Uh, and related to that about the value of people being able to show other people VR, I saw a tweet that said this that I thought was really kind of pithy and true, where they said, AR looks better in videos than in real life, but VR looks better in real life than in videos. And I think that uh, you know, all of us that have actually used headsets of different kinds like that, there's some real truth to that, where the magical world that, uh, you know, that Michael Abrash always talks about, our future of uh, the AR headsets and the holographic workers and everything there, that's not what AR actually looks like today when, uh, when you try on the headsets. And everybody's seen cool game trailers uh, about gameplay on flat screens, and honestly, a lot of the VR games look less impressive than your modern console games. But you put someone in the headset experiencing that, and it's a really different thing. So productivity side of things uh, is another aspect that we're not, ab we're not specifically pushing at all with Quest, but I keep hammering home that it's a universal platform. Anything we plan on doing for any SKU, anything in the future, we should be doing it on Quest right now. Even if we don't market it as such, uh, it should be good for that. Now, one of the areas where people are actually making money right now and having successful businesses is in various enterprise training applications. And there's an interesting split between a lot of things can be done very well just with uh, like with Go and 3 doff and then there are some specific training things that it's like go find this part, go put this part here, pull this breaker there that work very well with uh, the Quest controllers. So there are, you know, a large, there's a good sized ecosystem of real companies that are serving real customers and, you know, and having a great deal of value. I was super excited to see that stat in the keynote about the surgery, surgery readiness rates in VR training versus non-VR training. There's some real value to be had there. Now, uh, I had written a remote desktop application a couple years ago and did a lot of experiments with that early on. I'm actually really happy with the, uh, the, remote, the commercial remote desktop app available on Go and Quest. When I say like 99 out of 100 apps don't do the right thing for quality presentation, that's one of the ones that does do the right things for it. That's up on a layer using the super sampling. Every time I put in some neat new option like high quality distortion mesh, it was immediately used there. Uh, lots of options and configuration, so that's really nice. We have a lot of work internally going on to try to, uh, to automate or to make virtual meetings. You know, we're, like, I'm in Dallas, most of the, the company is in uh, Menlo Park or Seattle and uh, London, all these other places, so we live a lot on video conferences, and they're often not a great experience. There's a lot of value that we can imagine saying, uh, my normal thing is I've got somebody projecting their desktop there and then everybody else is scrunched down to this tiny little mess of pixels and I don't even recognize people when I actually meet them at OC6 because, oh, you were those 64 pixels that I saw in the video conference all the time. But if we can get to this point where uh, you get the big screen here for what you're looking at, but you have large views of the other people on conventional video conferencing there, and then you may have other people actually joining in VR with avatars. Uh, I think there's some, you know, some real value there. There's a little more debate over what the value of actual collaborative productivity work is, where that's sort of the, the science fiction, fidel high fidelity future of, well, we're all gonna work together in VR, but I kind of fall back onto my isolation introvert thing where I don't so much want to do that. Uh, and it's not clear that I, you know, going to the places where you're expecting everybody to wear a VR headset is necessarily the best bet. But we are running those experiments and starting to dog food them ourselves uh, internally at Oculus. Uh, there have been some of the things that are still a damn shame where our, virtual, our VR shell environment, where all of our first party apps are done, our Oculus video and browser and uh, library and home, all those different things, we still don't have a public SDK for it. I am, we are, I think, beginning to let some enterprise customers do some things there, but internally, 
it's still looked at. We're not, we're not as serious as we should be about the API and the app model that it was kind of put together roughly. But I think we've, uh, we've done ourselves a disservice there where so many of these video applications would have been much better done as a really simple shell application, high quality user interface, high quality player, and they would just be tiny, tiny applications rather than spinning up all of Unity to do some of those kind of basic uh, kind of me media and display presentations. Uh, some other things that we're lacking that are obvious on Android phones, like no ability to do local file management. This was I, uh, you know, a thing I ran into relatively recently, I had just finally gotten my last expert SS on uh, OST 1 and 2 on Beat Saber. I'm like, I'm going to record my kind of brag scoreboards and then upload it to Twitter. Uh, but it turns out, well, you can't actually have a file browser inside, uh, you know, inside our browser right now. So you can't go and find something. So that's a clear case. If we're going to be doing productivity things, you have file management that you need to do. Uh, you need to push things around. So there's, uh, there's a lot of different things there. Now, on the user experience, just kind of the general purpose side of things, there's still hundreds and hundreds of things to fix. And I swear I think a lot of people just tune me out now when I write these long lists of like all the nitpicky little details and things that should be getting better. Uh, I encourage everyone to use the user voice website. Uh, we really do look at that, and it lends so much more credibility to my arguments when I can say 500 people also think this is a good idea, and I can harp on it a little bit more internally. So we have, I'm proud of how many of them that we have knocked off, where the first couple pages of things on the Quest, a lot of those are, are handled now, and we've, uh, we've done a lot based on that. So I want us to keep digging all the way down through there, but definitely go in, make your voice heard, and kind of vote up things that are there, or if you've got specific issues, uh, write it up yourself, and uh, you know, point me at it. I'll be happy to kind of take a look at things, and if there are things that I haven't considered, uh, I can kind of advocate for them elsewhere. So I'm, you know, having a, a UI that just brings joy, that feels like it's happening instantly and it's doing your bidding, and we're not there yet. I was harping just a, last week about like how long library takes to open up. And I made this comment during, our, uh, during my app review. So I'm going to library after each one of these things to do it, and I'm twiddling my fingers for a little while, waiting for it to come up, saying this should have been instant. This should have just happened. Um, the harangue that I make internally is like, moving these images around, drawing this text, I could do this on like a 200 megahertz Dreamcast or something. We've got a two gigahertz processor with all this modern stuff. There is no excuse for it to be as slow as it is. But that's just, it's what happens to applications. If you, if you have a live app that you've been working on for a couple years, maybe you did a performance pass at one point and got it down to a good level, but features get added, things get changed, moved around, and just everything gets slower. It's the natural state of software, and it takes, you know, you need to fight that aggressively and violently when possible. You know, make things happen. You know, aim for things changing on the next frame. You want it to feel like a crisp video game, not some, you know, laggy application that will eventually get around to responding to what you've asked it to do. Uh, some of the other things that have been, uh, been improved, the, the Guardian is a problem for that pass around VR side of things where I do wish that we could, you know, if you put it on quickly, we'd just put the, the kind of the baseline, uh, the kind of the floor outline of things out. But we've made some improvements. The pass-through plus is a nice uh, change where early on, again, we had some people thinking that the pass-through video was going to be deeply uncomfortable, that it would make people instant, instantly sick because it's coming from, you know, the cameras are down here, not where your eyes are. And when you're putting that up there, everything has this shrunken down feel to it because it's like you've got uh, a much wider IPD. And like you look at your hands and they feel oddly distant from where we're rendering the controllers or where your proprioception sense thinks they are. So the pass-through plus is doing kind of classic uh, stereo uh, depth, uh, you know, depth determination from the cameras and it, it fits in it you know it takes a good a good chunk of power but it's being done really when you're not mixing it with other things uh, very much so it's a decent little comfort value there power management is still something that it's great as a consumer device that people actually use battery life uh, and battery management starts becoming a real issue and just this morning for some reason i, I got up to play around with Beat Saber in my hotel, as people do, and I, my battery was dead on my right controller, I, so something was wrong there. I don't know if it was kind of resting against uh, the trigger or something, and something kept it alive, but there are still clearly things that, uh, that need to get better there. And it was also interesting seeing people 
very much be happy with Quest charging faster than Go does. And there's things that start becoming trade-offs and actual hardware costs to put things into, like get super fast charging and different things. Uh, other platform things like software installs. I went through recently installing a number of different apps, and I look at the times, and for reasons that I don't understand, you, you say, I want to get this app. It spends longer preparing to download than sometimes it takes to download, and then longer still to actually install before you get into things. And again, we've been hit over the head with the importance of friction and getting into experiences, uh, the value of that. We should be making this you know, really high priority to smooth all those things out. And there's stuff like that we want very much. Like you should be able to have, people talk about you're isolated from your phone when you're in the VR headset. Obviously, we would like you to be able to have your phone in VR, but it's not clear how we go about doing that. I, you know, we would need cooperation from phone vendors to be able to cast the entire screen up there and to work. Maybe there's a way that we can just get notifications forwarded or some kind of halfway situa situation, but eventually, in the, the robust future VR world, you expect to be able to do everything that you do on your phone. I mean, eventually we expect AR to replace phones in many ways, but we've got this intermediate period where hopefully people will be spending large amounts of time in VR and their phones are important. We need to find some way to surface that stuff in there. So I'll probably run out the rest of the time sort of running down the hardware decision tree for future headsets where we're not going to announce any, you know, any new products, uh, but you can maybe you know, infer some possible directions that things could go. Now, unfortunately, we don't have sort of the, the Tony Stark auto fab where you say, I want some of this and some of this, you fab me up a headset to, uh, to test. Uh, internally, we make a pretty good number of uh, test headsets for things, but there are so many different options uh, that you can choose from here about what might be the optimal one. We don't get to test uh, anywhere close to exhaustively. And there's also the significant problem that when you, when you cobble something together for a test, it may be very far from what the consumer experience is. And you may be able to have something that's functional, but it might not really tell you whether it's actually going to be good or not. And sometimes you have to take sort of a leap of faith where for a long time it was kind of scary how the controller tracking was looking on Quest and Rift S up until not too long before launch where there was real worries about is this even good enough to ship, but more progress gets made and then updates get made and, and it turns out really good. And in general, in a lot of these cases, I tell people that uh, there are directions that we could be taking with sensor configurations that I think would be valuable, but a lot of times the tracking teams are a little hesitant because it's scary to kind of take on some of these challenges. But I, I have a lot, of, I have a lot of faith in our ability to get these things worked out once we just say, all right, this is what we've got, we're going to make it work, and we're gonna just kind of keep grinding on it until it is good enough. Now, all the things that you can put in, they're obviously not without cost. You can't just say, well, I want all of these, because you've got price is an issue. I, I mean, we have some signal on price point where I thought Quest's price was gonna be more of a detriment relative to Go, but there's the questions of, I. You know, is this just because we're still selling to the early adopter enthusiasts? I, I still tend to believe that getting back down to a cheaper price point is really important when we want to have really mass market broad adoption. But we have a few of these signals that for the people that are currently buying our headsets, a little bit more cost might not be you know, that big of a deal. Like we had Gear VR went up uh, when we included the controller, didn't make a difference. More people buy the, uh, the higher memory SKU of uh, Go than they do the lower memory, and Quest is selling quite well. But there are also the problems of kind of the opportunity cost of when you put something in, where there's this, this thinking initially that, oh, hardware, hardware is hard, software goes quickly, and that's not always the case. When you get into this, when you're dealing with big systems like computer vision or how you deal with the device drivers in the operating system layer, it was a, uh, you know, it was an eye-opener for me a few years ago when we were working on early versions of the computer vision tracking. I was doing some experimental work on the PC, and I said, well, if somebody will put together something on mobile for me to work with, uh, you know, that would be great. And one of the E's actually did cobble some Frankenstein thing together on a Gear VR case that gave me the cameras, and then it turned out that I didn't actually have time to go do the software to, to actually use it. So we have some of these cases where we have built some headsets that have not been fully exploited because we have not been able to get the software bandwidth to come around and actually take full advantage of the hardware. And then we're still 
eking out a lot more performance for things on the hardware that we have. I mean, there, are, there is actually a lot of, not exactly low-hanging fruit, but there's still fruit to be picked on all of our tracking things uh, on Quest, and I expect it will continue to get better over the rest of its lifetime. So some of the, uh, you know, some of the biggest questions that you have is where you split the architecture. We have put everything in the front, which is the most manufacturable, uh, the cheapest, generally easiest way to set things up, but it makes it front heavy, it can exacerbate cooling problems, and it can have some other challenges where you can imagine wanting to put it in back. Like our very first uh, ProtoQuest headset had a big puck on the back uh, with a fan and a heat sink and everything sticking out of it, but the headset was very light. It didn't have any guts up there, so there's, uh, there's some value there. And we continuously talk about, do you put the battery in back? And you'd think, oh, it's just a couple pennies of wire that you have to do to wire it back there. But it's surprisingly impactful on the whole design to do that. Uh, and then there's a question of, do you do a split design? Do you have, whether it's a phone or a compute puck of some kind that you have wired down to sit in your pocket or completely wireless? Something where you have just enough processing on the headset to be able to do essentially remote rendering from your pocket. Uh, there's trade-offs for all that. The most obvious question for virtual reality is the display questions, where uh, at one level you've got single display or dual display. That impacts whether you can cant the displays, you can get more field of view if you can tilt the, if you've got wide enough area that it doesn't become really obvious that you're stealing overlap, you can cant the, uh, the lenses and get more peripheral vision in. Um, if you've got two, disp uh, two displays, you can make a nice clean interaxial uh, adjustment system where you can still do that on a, single, uh, on a single screen, where you can still go ahead and have the screen under there and move the lenses on top of that, but that adds some complexity, and if you go to an extreme area, you start trading off your field of view at the end where you don't have enough pixels to be able to keep sliding it. Well, if it was two completely separate displays, you've got a lot more options there. Then you've got the question of LCD versus OLED, and we've been kind of flip-flopping back and forth on this across our different products, where LCD is generally uh, cheaper and denser. Uh, there are more systems using LCDs. Uh, you can generally get a little bit higher pixel uh, density. The OLEDs tend to cheat a little bit with the pentile layouts. They have some other reasons to do that for like blue, life, uh, blue sub pixel lifespans. But in general, if you want the highest resolution, you probably get an LCD. Uh, the backlights can be brighter, so you've got more opportunity for doing possible high dynamic range things if you have kind of a segmented backlight. Um, and they can be, uh, you may be able to get faster, refre or, uh, faster refresh rates in some cases, and subdivided backlights can get back the latency that you would have uh, with the normal transition time for the LCDs. You know, the OLEDs offer the things that we touted for so long on Rift, where you have lower latency, they instantly turn on, uh, you've got better contrast where you can have absolutely pure blacks. Uh, you can make OLED displays that are flexible, that you can bend into different configurations, which I still think might be useful in some of our optics arrangements. I, you know, it's, it's you know, there are current optics people generally say, it's like, well, we can handle everything that we need to with kind of changes in the lenses profile. Uh, what we would ideally like would be curved on two, dimen uh, two dimensions, but nobody has made sort of a bowl-shaped uh, OLED display demo yet, but that might be interesting. Um, the, the persistence changes between the two, where the OLEDs, you can command them on and off with sort of microsecond level precision, but they're not all that bright. So if you had uh, a combination of filters or multi-bounce optics or something, OLEDs are hard to do because they don't really get bright enough. Unless you leave them on for a very long time, then you've got motion blur. While LCDs have the, um, they don't transition very fast, so you need to pulse the backlight, but you can make a very bright, shortly pulsed backlight, and that works surprisingly well in Go and Rift S. Uh, now, interestingly, the limit on the refresh rate for Go and Rift S is, uh, we run Go at 72 and Rift S a little higher at 80. Uh, that display can run higher, like we've had it internally running at 90 frames per second, kind of like the classic Rift, but it's so temperature sensitive where you start off and you've got a clear double image until it really heats up and gets, uh, and gets very warm and then the LCDs are switching fast enough that it can actually run at that rate. So I did uh, look into the possibility of can we change some of these and in fact, uh, on Quest, we've got the issue that the OLED displays that we've got there absolutely can run 90 frames per second, where we had a bake-off early on where we had the same content running at 90 and 72, 
And we decided to go with 72 because it was just going to be too hard for most content to make 90 frames per second. But some content could. And as we were back to remote rendering now, I'm like, oh, we could do more content there. We could remote render at 90 frames per second. That would be a nice little bonus relative to Rift S. But uh, the display people told me that our, our FCC certification would be voided if we changed the clock rate on the display. So that's too bad. Uh, I don't think we're going to try to recertify the device. But maybe future headsets, we will try to crank them up higher than we imagine that we might possibly use, because uh, we would like to have the headroom to be able to maybe change that in the future. There's been some interesting work on uh, kind of diffusers to be able to hide the pixel structure for displays where if you can blend together, especially you've got the big screen door effect on uh, some of the OLED displays where you've got larger areas of black between them. But even on the RGB stripe displays like Go and Rift S, it would be nicer if you had a perfect little blend of three pixels in an inscribed circle uh, around it that would be higher quality video. We've looked at a number of them and not pulled the trigger on actually using any of them, but I think there's probably still something there. But the big number that everybody looks at is resolution. I, you know, we know that what matters is angular resolution in VR. Uh, not so much what the resolution of the display is, but how big the pixels are uh, in your view. And right now, we basically have a system where you've got, if you've got a 1280 display and it's covering 90 degrees, your field of view, that's about what our optimal pixel density is. And that's really low. You know, nobody uses displays at that resolution really anymore. We need to kind of double the display to a 4K uh, density to sort of get that as a 180 home theater screen, uh, as a 1080, uh, kind of a 1080p sort of display. And that's definitely coming. Those displays exist today. Uh, you can go buy them uh, for various, uh, from various vendors. But I am, you know, and we tested that, interestingly, all the way back on Go. We, uh, we ran the Go as if it was driving a 4K display, and it works. You, know, you, you certainly can't render a game at that resolution, but if you're rendering immersive video or Netflix or something flat content, that actually works fine there. So we are more than ready to drive those displays for, uh, for a lot of media content immediately. And as we get to future SOCs, there's enough power to do immersive content even at that resolution. But you've got a wide scalability range where you can always render at a lower resolution and just let it get stretched up. Uh, and then so, yeah, on the refresh rate, going from 60 to 72 to 80 to 90, and 120 is still the magic number for perfect division of 24 frames per second film content and 30 and 60 frames per second video content. But it is... Uh, it's really tough to imagine rendering a lot of content on mobile at 120, so you have to figure some kind of frame interpolation. And you can make great, you can do great things with that for relatively static scenes. You can have it look perfect on the reprojection almost, even with a very coarse dense map from, uh, depth map from it. But as soon as you have animation, or most critically, your hand controllers moving around, they're going to get a doubled up stutter blur on them, which, which is pretty impactful. So I'm not super sold yet on broadly adopting uh, you know, frame, rate, uh, frame rate interpolation for things. You know, and we are, that's another thing. So we have internally a lot of these uh, space warp sorts of things uh, running on Quest, but it has a little bit less of an advantage than it does on PC, because on PC you have these crazy expensive uh, fragment shaders, and replicating all of that over there with video hardware and reprojection makes some sense, while on Quest, for the most part, our fragment shaders are really simple, and the question of just doing that with something else versus just doing more samples is, is a little bit less clear-cut, but we'll probably still eventually have something from that. Uh, other possible options are waveguide displays, you know, what people use for the AR displays, where, like, somebody was showing me an AR display yesterday, and the problem with AR is that most of the time, again, it looks better in the videos than it does in real life. You can't see anything until you look down at the black floor to give it enough of a backdrop to be able to kind of make out the quality, but they are extremely high resolution. They don't have a lot of field of view, but you could imagine VR displays using kind of the largest possible waveguide display is just blacked out on the back and giving you an extremely high density display in a very lightweight system as well. So that ties in with optics, where waveguides are sort of the optics combined with the display, but for uh, OLED and, L uh, and LCD displays, you've got a lot of options from you know, single, uh, kind of single Fresnel uh, lenses, doublets, multi-pass optics, and you can see some of the differences, like uh, PSVR has, they use lenses that give them a nice broad eye box, and it's very, uh, 
it's very forgiving of exactly where you ha uh, have it on, but it has, they have a relatively low resolution display, so they don't need to worry as much about crispness. But there's, uh, and there's a lot of subtleties like in the Fresnel lenses, little issues about how you cut the angles on the side of it. Like you should be able to recognize that our current generation Fresnels in Go and Rift S are substantially better for the glare effects than the original Rift lenses. You know, the original Rift, Rift lenses, you'd see the Unreal Engine logo come up and it's just spraying light reflections everywhere all over the place. And it's not perfect now, but it is improved. Uh, field of view, mostly determined by the optics, is one of the things that some people don't appreciate the trade-offs that get made here, where if you make a very large field of view and you have a normalish projection across it, you need enormously higher resolution to keep the same angular acuity. Most of the lenses do do a pretty good job of concentrating the detail in the middle, but then you wind up with compressed pixels at the edges and you still have to render that to your eye buffer and make a trade-off. For immersive media, like I was mentioning for the possible Gear VR thing, that works pretty well because you've got all the stuff already there and it's pretty straightforward to just pick the pixels that you want. But if you're rendering it directly and you say that all of a sudden you need a 2K by 2K buffer to get decent pixel fidelity for a, a 120 wide FOV, then you've spent a whole lot of performance for a somewhat mediocre gaze uh, gain from it. Clarity across the field is something that we've made a lot of good strides relative to, again, the older Gear VR systems. I, Right in the middle, you could read some of the text, but just kind of pushing it off to the side, uh, it would be more out of focus and hard to resolve the text, while our current lenses are, you know, are pretty good for that. But there's still quite a bit that can be done there to make uh, things that are crisp across the entire field of view. But then you often trade off about having a very precise eye box, needing to get your eyes in exactly the right place to make this, you know, whatever other optics characteristics you're looking for. And I do tend to think that I, you know, I comment that people put on the headsets differently practically every time. If you just, even for the same person, you have them put on the headset five times and you take video of it, it'll be crooked and canted in different ways and it's not giving people a great kind of positioning. We have the adjustment for, uh, for uh, the IPD uh, for the user, but I suspect most people don't even have that in the right place and half the time it probably doesn't matter because the headset's not put, you know, not settled on their face in exactly the same way. Uh, and so one thing that I would like to see eventually is when we make really lightweight headsets, I think what we need is actually nose pieces, just like glasses have. I mean, if you, have, if you had your, gla your prescription glasses and they were just in ski goggles and they were kind of mashed around at random places on your head, it wouldn't work nearly as well as something that registers onto your nose in some place. Uh, yeah, the, the Gear VR focus wheel is kind of a, something that was a lot of people missed it when they didn't have it about being able to like wear with or without their glasses and being able to adjust the focus. But it turns out that's really pretty challenging to do things that move around like that for, uh, for displays because the phone, you could always take it out and wipe it down. But we see cases where you get something back from the clean room assembly in the factory and a couple little specks of dust have gotten in there somehow and it's just gonna be sitting there right on the screen in your focal plane doing a lot of damage to the VR experience. On the audio side of things, I know audiophiles will always, you know, always want more, but I'm super happy with the drivers that we've got in our current headsets. Uh, I think the convenience from just having it in the arms is worth whatever limitations we have on the, the reproducible range. I made a point of trying to play with high quality headphones relative to it, and I, I don't think it's worth the extra headache of putting them on for the most cases. I think we've done a good job there. We do always have the headphone jacks for people to be able to uh, plug something in. Bluetooth headphone support is something that comes up a lot. I know that's in our user voice somewhere. And it's probably past time for us to go back and really revisit that. When we did previously, they all had more latency than we thought was acceptable for a VR experience. We're telling people to do all this spatialized audio. And if you wind up with enough of a gap there or missing the lip sync on something you're presenting. But it's been years now, and I, I kind of expect that things may be better now, and we should be able to find some way so that people can get some high-quality headphones and not have to worry about dangling the cord over and plugging it in different ways. Uh, on the IPD adjustment for the displays, there are options of kind of continuous smooth or possibly little detented multi-step options that might make it more reproducible or cheaper to manufacture in various ways. The choices of the, the, system, the core system on a chip that we use, 
Now, I know we've been dinged in reviews sometimes for why do we use somewhat obsolete uh, chips, where we used an 820 for, for Go and an 835 for Quest, and people say it's like, oh, but that's last year's or, uh, or year before last cell phone in some case. Why aren't we on the actual state of the art? And I think we, again, made the right call to go ahead and be a little bit back where we had enough problems bringing up our very first VR operating system, dealing with all the custom stuff that we had to do, working with something that's not bleeding edge gave us some slack, and we were able to deliver you know, what we needed to there. But we've got a skilled team now that's been around the block a few times with it, and I think it's likely we will be closer to the state of the art in the future. You know, The trade-offs that you can make uh, you've got all the vendors for it, where on Gear VR, we always had to support Qualcomm and Exynos because Samsung always dual sourced so that they could never be really over a barrel if uh, a supplier had a problem in a particular generation. And we can look at Qualcomm, Exynos, cheaper come places like MediaTek and some of the other uh, specialty silicon places. But we have a great relationship with Qualcomm. I'm really happy working with them. I, I, you know, I think it's, I advocate certainly for us to be sticking with Qualcomm for a while. Uh, the question that ties into that, though, is how much custom silicon we want to do, where there's always things that you can say, well, computer vision things in particular and various neural network accelerations, we could specify silicon to say this is exactly what we want. We can go ahead and make this like 10 times more power efficient than doing it even on the, the GPU or DSP in some cases. So there's massive gains to be had there. But the pipeline for that is so long, it's a matter of baking in, saying, we want this capability this many years in the future. And I've always been pretty hesitant about that because like our algorithms and things, we're changing these things even after we've shipped them. Uh, I don't think that we have a great vision of exactly what we need years down the, the road, where you're making a decision that's going to be affecting things for probably five years. It takes a couple years to get it out, and then you've got it in market for a couple years and supporting it for a while after that. Um, you know, there's, there's possibilities that the vendors might sneak something small in for you just into their, the chips that they sell to everybody, and you've got the option of maybe having it disabled for everybody, but it's just a little bit of a few square millimeters of silicon that's your, your stuff inside their product. So there's different possibilities. But we do, uh, you know, we're extracting a lot of value out of the, the CPUs, GPUs, and the DSP. You know, that's, that's been the magic thing that's allowed us to deliver the hand tracking on Quest without it kind of catastrophically impacting performance everywhere. The, uh, the DSP that we used for a little bit of the computer vision tracking work, it still had a fair amount of extra potential uh, open for it there. So we were able to get most of the hand tracking work done either on the cores that we were also using for vision or uh, on the DSP there without impacting the main resources, the CPU and GPU that, that we give to the developers. Uh, in the future, uh, most of the modern current state-of-the-art SOCs are having these kind of tensor accelerators for making neural network stuff go faster, which we are going to be able to take pretty good advantage of because all the things that involve really complicated processing of the video that is not, you know, the computer vision tracking is reasonably nice in that it's a geometric problem, but looking at hands or body tracking, those are very squishy problems that the neural nets are very well suited for that are hard to solve in a kind of strictly analytical way. RAM has been a little bit of an issue where we kind of promised developers more RAM than they actually got. We were saying like 2.75 gigs and you don't really get that much in Quest. We are still struggling internally to kind of give, give that back to you what we sort of promised. I, you know, there's a lot of things that we can look at, like swapping to compressed memory, swapping to actual flash. We are kind of turning the screws on all of our internal apps and systems. I, but we're going to have, there's going to be a terrible hammer coming down when, as we start to support multitasking, which is very much on our way of being a productivity system. We want to be able to support multiple apps at the same time. Well, you will just eventually run out of memory. And I think we have, at some point, we need to embrace something that's more of a big hammer like swapping approach for things. And then we can at least get everything out of the way when a game is running. But the easy solution, of course, is to just say, throw more memory at it. But it will always be a problem at some point. We will have this nice period where when we go to a new generation, all of the old hardware all of a sudden has tons more memory. But it will be no time at all before all that memory is then used up for all the new things. Uh, the power management, like I mentioned before, uh, battery capacity and weight is is a huge question where we have, we have I, I don't know the exact, whether it's an equal number of people, but we have plenty of people that say both 
the battery runs down too fast and the headset is too heavy. You know, they, are, they directly trade against each other. We could make a headset that lasts all day, but it's gonna have a brick of a battery attached to it. And similarly, we can save a whole lot of weight on the headset by just putting in a teeny tiny battery that just you know, only lasts an hour or something. So we are continuously kind of reevaluating that trade. And it's not like you can uh, exactly choose anything on the slider. It's a notchy slider about exactly which, you know, which batteries have which charging options and which sizes. Can we make them flexible to fit into a back strap? Lots of different questions there. Again, the charging speed, it would be nice to have the, the super high speed charging where you can just kind of really cram a lot of the power in quickly. Some people have asked for the possibility of wireless charging. It's very slow trickle charging, but if you can just set your headset down on the pad, you know, that might be nice for some things. Uh, you know, we have, like, we have a, a notification which never seems to work right for me from the Oculus Companion app saying, you know, your headset needs to be charged. Like, it, you, I get that notification when I finally plug it in, so something's not going right with, uh, with that. But that's, it's, it was a common problem of people set their headset over, they didn't plug it in. The idea was it's bad for your VR retention if somebody says, oh, I wanted to go play VR, I hadn't in a week or two, and the headset's dead. Uh, you've just kind of lost one of your relatively small number of shots at them getting that. So it's a good idea that I want to make actually work correctly. On the external ports, I, you know, so USB has the options in some cases of wiring video directly through it for some, uh, some cases, but I suspect in the end that's not actually going to be useful for us because what the limits of the display port that you can do over most of those cables aren't going to be as high of resolution as we want, so we would want to do some compression sort of thing better. So I think we're better off taking the step to doing compressed encodings for remote rendering than to actually use the, the dedicated wired hardware for that. But it is an option for some things. Plugging more things into the USB port, I was pretty shocked at how much power the little USB sticks draw for, um, for memory, or just when you plug them in to play a video or something off of them. It was over a watt for the one that I was checking, which is a staggering amount for the tiny little crumb of uh, flash drive that's sitting there. But I think that's a useful peripheral. And it is nice that because we are essentially an Android system, a surprising number of things do kind of work when you plug them in with joysticks, keyboards, mice, uh, for doing a lot of the productivity things. It's nice that, uh, that a lot of those things work and we're slowly getting our, uh, you know, getting our system software, giving it a UI to be able to do that without having to go through really obscure paths. On the, uh, the wireless communication side, you know, we've got options of higher end Wi-Fi that lets us do, you know, gives us plenty more bandwidth and hopefully less latency for, uh, for remote rendering. You know, one of, the one of the worries is some of the bands get so crowded that even if you theoretically have enough bandwidth, you might have five neighbors that have uh, access points that are polluting all the things with what's going on there. Uh, Something that I learned on Go that I didn't realize that if you're on a classic 2.4 gigahertz Wi-Fi, we have to cut the bandwidth in half because we have to share it with the Bluetooth for the controller. If you're on five gigahertz, then that's not a problem there, but uh, that turns out to be an issue for some of the high rate streaming things. It's exciting to find out how many tweaks that we've got at the firmware level for making remote rendering work better across the existing Wi-Fi links. Uh, like another thing that I was, kind of surprised to learn is that you essentially don't drop packets over Wi-Fi, which sounds, uh, you know, it sounds unlikely with all of that going on, but the access points just continuously retransmit, so instead you get a very long delay of potentially these 100, 200 uh, milliseconds. But you can tune a lot of things to, uh, to change this. So the idea that if we tune everything that's in our headset and we offer maybe a little plug-in dongle or some kind, you know, there, there are a lot of these little Wi-Fi things you just sit on your USB port. And if we do something like that with custom firmware changes, then we can make a super high quality Wi-Fi experience. So I'm pretty excited about that direction. And then we always get asked about 5G. You know, how's 5G going to impact VR? And mostly that comes from a pull from the 5G vendors want some you know, magic, cool, awesome hook for why you need 5G. And really, it's just more bandwidth. You know, it's, it's just like a good Wi-Fi connection that you've got everywhere. I, you know, you could make, you know, you could lean in and have really awesome immersive video streaming at high bit rates rather than kind of the lower rates that we force for things right now. There's things you could do, but it doesn't have a unique quality to it. It's just a better pipe. And, you know, they're in kind of a tough situation trying to make it magical and new when it's just X more bandwidth. 
The cameras that you can put on there are probably the biggest architectural decision where uh, we have the whole range from like PSVR has one camera looking at you. Uh, the, the Microsoft mixed reality systems have two wide angle cameras. Quest has four cameras. Rift S has five cameras. Qualcomm actually made a custom version of their, uh, their SOCs for targeting AR, VR, you know, the XR one and two line of chips. And they're supporting like 12 or 13 cameras, some huge number going in. But you can actually run through that number pretty quick if you're, I, you know, if you think about it, you want five tracking cameras, maybe two eye tracking cameras, two cameras for face tracking, uh, two color cameras for mixed reality pass through, one dedicated depth sensing camera. Uh, you know, it, it all adds up. And I do tend to think that that sort of spider eye VR headset is probably not the, you know, the best direction to be going for things. They're not free. They're not massless. I, you know, they take work and effort to wind up making them do all the things that you want them to do for the reasons that you put them in there. But there's, you know, there's legitimate questions about exactly how many cameras, where I always thought it's likely that uh, kind of the end state of this is probably two wide am angle cameras, but uh, you know, my Beat Saber habit might be uh, encouraging me to have, uh, have more cameras for better hand tracking or better controller tracking. Um, uh, as a little side note about that, one of the things early on that was a, an important decision for Quest is we had, when we were deciding how we were going to set up all the cameras, there was the question of how you angle all of them. And for optimal controller tracking, having all of the cameras pointing in essentially different directions gives you the broadest chance of being able to pick up a controller in any given place. But I was fairly insistent on I wanted binocular overlap to be able to do, uh, you know, to make hand tracking better and to be able to do some of the possible mixed reality things there. And for a while it was looking like we probably weren't gonna do hand tracking on Quest. So I'm, I'm really happy now that we did decide to push ahead on that and lots of work has gone into kind of getting that to the state that it is now. And very much like our controller tracking, we can expect that to continuously get better through the kind of the life of the product. But this does mean that because we have the two cameras pointing generally forward instead of fully angled out, there are so probably like 1% lower scores in Beat Saber or something are due to the cameras not being optimally positioned there. You know, when you swing back, it coasts for like three seconds or so. When you're out of view, you've got this period where it's just keeping track of it before it gives up. And if you bring it back in, it's gonna do well. But you know, there's going to be those edge cases where it wasn't quite fast enough and then it takes a long time to reacquire uh, when it comes back in and you've missed something. That's another one of the areas where, again, we have still fruit to be picked to make these things better. Quest is not in its final form for optimization, where when you finally do bring a controller back into view, it, uh, it takes quite a few frames for it to decide that those little spots are the controller and grab it. It is conceivable that we could be grabbing the controllers in a single frame acquisition if it's fitting in our model of roughly where it might be. There are uh, aspects of when we, you know, when you have the controller like doing the bow and arrow pose right here and it's failing because it can't see any of the dots, there are things that we could be looking at on the curve of the controller ring there to be able to estimate where its pose is and get it close enough. Uh, right now we have to trade off between the, uh, we have a choice of either running the hand tracking or running the controller tracking, which makes for some awkward UI about how we have to switch between that where you can easily imagine wanting to just kind of pick and say, okay, Beat Saber, now I need to grab my controllers. It'd be nice if they were drawn there and you could go pick them up, but we actually have to switch off hand tracking because we use different exposures for tracking the world, tracking the hands, and tracking the controllers. But I can imagine a future headset where you've leaned in more onto using the hand tracking more often, you've used uh, higher refresh rate cameras, and you want to do this continuously for that because you can make, if you're doing them both at the same time, you can make the controller tracking better by leveraging the hand tracking. I mean, knowing where your hand is or your arm helps when the controller is actually out of view, and that extends all the way to full body tracking. You want to be able to go ahead and get your torso, get your legs when you're looking down, and then if you've got a, a good kinetic model of the body, even if your controller is back here, we can have a pretty good sense of where it is, and we should just basically never drop the controller at that point. So, I, and then you can imagine games, like right now if you've played with the, uh, the hand tracking, there is, more than 80 milliseconds more latency on there than the controller. There's no IMUs in your hand to be able to extrapolate. So 
it's, it feels a lot more latent than the controllers, but that's something that there's room for improving that. As we get to uh, future things, running the cameras, instead of 30 frames per second, tracking the hands, doing all of the work there, we can get to the point of running 90 frames per second, tracking everything, overlapping the calculation of that with the camera scan in, because you want to get to the point where you could do something like Beat Saber not holding controllers at all, just kind of moving your arms around. And I mean, like you can imagine at that point throwing high kicks at notes flying by, and having uh, full body experiences in a way that you can, you can sort of get with putting controllers on your feet and doing some of the extra tracking things that are interesting, but you know, not, it's again a barrier. And when you get to the point where you can just carry the headset around, put it on, do lots of neat things, uh, that will be, that'll be pretty great. So eye tracking and face tracking have some interesting trades to be made between them, where if you want eye tracking for very precise pupil direction for foveated rendering, then you want to have the cameras focused really just centered around the eyes. But if you choose to, uh, if you want to be able to kind of uh, detect some of the facial signals of smiling and so on, then you'd like to have it pointing down more. And it's an interesting set of trades there where we still have not seen the slam dunk perfect foveated rendering demo of uh, this is absolutely unnoticeable. Uh, even on the PC where you can throw lots more hardware and have less latency on it, you can still usually kind of see when you glance around, uh, it's blurry for, you know, for a little instant, and it's going to be worse on mobile because the processing is going to take longer, there's a longer GPU pipeline for the tiled renderers, and it's just going to be a little worse. So it's possible we could put in eye tracking systems and it turns out not to be that huge of a win for foveated rendering, that you can't dial it down to the super precise focus and save lots of, uh, you know, lots of power elsewhere. And it's also kind of the issue that the, uh, the foveated rendering that we've got, when it falls down, some of the areas, the sparkling and shimmering going on in the rest of the periphery is more objectionable than we might have hoped it would be. So it becomes a trade-off then. You might use a pair of cameras to be able to get uh, some of the social cues of seeing when someone's smiling or smirking. We can pull, uh, we can pull a fair amount of visemes by the audio analysis. If you're, someone's actually talking, we can do pretty good avatar mouth animations. But there are a fair number of times when you know, people are scowling or smiling and these subtle things where there's no audio involved and there's no way that we're going to get that without putting a camera on it for some way. And I'm still somewhat skeptical about the value of those, but again, I've got my place as more isolationist, less uh, sociable for the different things. It may be, uh, you know, it may turn out to be a critical feature for making people having, you know, warm, happy interactions with people. So, uh, and I've got my please wrap up, other sessions are starting. Uh, okay, well, we can carry on in the halls for a little bit. I've got one other thing to get to after this, but I'll be around the rest of the day and available. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.